Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So during this month of February, we're giving a little extra attention to some of the minor prophets. Those last 12 books of the Old Testament are called the minor prophets. And they're, they're called the minor prophets not because they're unimportant, but simply because they're sort of short compared to major prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah. Uh, but, you know, sometimes that happens where we can feel minor, right? We can feel small. We can feel a little bit unimportant. But just as God used all of the prophets, all the words of the Bible to speak his message to every place he wants it to go, so also for any of us, none of us is minor in the sense of unimportant. Uh, but God uses the gifts of each and every person. And so we're going to hear from Amos, the minor prophet Amos today, the, the lesson that he was given by God to take to the people so many hundreds of years ago, and why that lesson still speaks to our hearts in our day and age. But first, let's uh, say together our mission statement, reminding ourselves why God brings us here. Grace exists to strengthen people in their relationship with Jesus Christ, and to empower them to share Jesus with others. We sing our first song.
to invite you to stand for the words of invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. In peace, let us pray to the Lord for the peace that comes from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer you praise, let us pray to the Lord. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand the things they ought to do, and then may also have the grace and strength to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. And now a reading from Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament book of Amos in the 7th and 8th chapters. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the lovely young woman and strong young men will faint because of thirst. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Music people coming? Here we go.
New Testament reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ is raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to honor God's holy gospel. Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were that was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. And the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. For that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith together with the church down through the ages with these words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
Please be seated. Can I have the youngins come on up and meet Miss April here in the front? Hi, how are y'all today? Good. You know what treats I have today. Smarties. Do you know why I give you Smarties? Because you're smart. I knew you would understand. See, you're smart. I told you. So I have a question for you. Do you ever do things that are hard? Yeah? Tell me something you've done that's hard to do, or was hard to do when you did it the first time. It's okay. I tried making the part one of Sonic.exe, but I could never do it. It is hard to make things, to create things, isn't it? What about you, Zayden? Um, um, I wanted to do it uh, out when it was snowing. I was collecting like flat ice things. Mm-hmm. Kind of like icicles. Yeah. Mm, okay. Um, but, but the icicle is like this, and the stick will be like there. So where did you put them once you got them? Um, in my pile. Um, I got some. <laughs> was it outside? Okay. <laughs> and it was hard because it gets heavy and it's yeah. cold, isn't it? Yeah, I had to kick it all the way over there. Oh my gosh. That would break it. It could oh, break it. Really hard. Did it, break it. it is hard to do those things. What about, is it ever hard to do something new? Yeah, and it's also. Down, but well, we don't want in. robbers. It's supposed yeah, to be hard for them to get in. And it, yeah. Yeah. But imagine but you I would were just go through the, the only window. thing you had to do was kick the wall. Over. Then that would be bad. Yeah, but if you were super strong. Um, so, since you said that, it's hard to do good things sometimes, isn't it? No, uh, uh, are you? Are you always nice? Always? You've never been mean? Not even once? You've never thrown a fit? No, I have seen me. Many times. <laughs> many times. But you know what? You're not by yourself. We've all done that. You want to see? Watch this. Watch. How many of us in the room have ever been mean? Raise your hand. Everybody. You know why? Because sometimes doing good things is hard, too. I'll tell you, today was really hard for me. Our lovely friend Gina made me sing today. Can you believe that? I was terrified. But you know what? Sometimes we have to do something new. Because you know what we did when we sang? We praised God, and we shared who he was with everybody here. And sometimes that's not easy to do. But do you know why it's so important? Because we have a God that loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, because he knew that it was going to be hard for us to do good things. He knew it was going to be hard for us to be nice all the time. He knew it was going to be hard for us to do the things that we should to help other people. He knew it was going to be hard for us to tell people who he was. So doing good things is hard. But Jesus came down here because he said, you know what? We're going to help them so that they can still spend eternity with us in heaven. So he came down, and he was a man. He came as a baby, just like we did. And then he died to pay for all of our sins and all the hard things that we were supposed to do that we didn't do. He died for all of that stuff because he loves us so, so much. But you know what? He loves all of them, too. Wait, um, how, how did he get na- nails on him? How did he get nails on him? 
They did. They hammered them. Yeah, it hurts. Think of when you step on something sharp, but way, way worse. It hurts. Like a Lego that accidentally had. Yes, stepping on a Lego is painful. Very. All of the adults in the room will agree. That hurts. But that's why we have Jesus, so that he can help us through all of those hurts and all of those hard things. So can you pray with me? And then guess what? I have smarties for you because you are smart. And you guys all know that already. Don't worry. Okay, so can you fold your hands? Awesome. And then can you repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to help us do hard things. Help us to get better at doing good things. In your name we pray. Amen. of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, to introduce myself, I am Amos, Amos the prophet, the, the third of the 12 so-called minor prophets, those little books at the very end of the Old Testament. And earlier on today, you heard a reading from my book. You heard just a little snippet from near the, near the end of the book in which I explained a little bit about who I was, that I was not a, somebody who came up trained by another prophet in the school of prophets, we called it. I was not a follower of one specific kind of person. I was simply a shepherd, a shepherd, and in my spirit, Tommy also tended to the fig trees. But one day... One day, God decided to call me and to put me to work as a prophet, which I had never would have expected, because that was totally outside of my usual kind of job role. And, and so, as I say in the opening verse of my book, the book of Amos, I was a shepherd from Tekoa. Tekoa, a little tiny town, oh, 10, 12 miles maybe outside of Jerusalem. And in the area of Tekoa is where I herded my sheep. Now, I 
was there in a very remote kind of area in a wild and uh, sort of country, which fit me because I was, I was really sort of a wild, beastly person. I was an outdoorsman, to say the least, which, of course, I had to be if I was going to take care of my flocks like that. This was my life. It's the only life I knew. And one day when I was out there with my sheep, out in the middle of nowhere, basically, the Lord came to me and said, Amos, I have a burden, which was interesting. That caught my ear because my name, Amos, means burden bearer. And so the Lord said to me, I have a burden that I need you to speak to my people, the people of Israel and of Judah. I need you to be my prophet for a short time. And I resisted. And I said, Lord, I'm not trained to be a prophet. I don't, I don't like, I'm not even, I don't even live around people. I don't like getting up in front of people. And besides, Lord, you can get somebody else. And why do you even need anybody? Aren't things going well? Isn't the nation prosperous? Isn't the economy strong? Aren't people healthy and happy? And, and the Lord replied and said, no, Amos. No, there is a famine in the land there is a famine, not of food, but there is a famine of the word of the Lord. Now, you're right, Amos, there are lots of prophets, but those prophets that are out there, they are not preaching my word. They're simply preaching what the people want to hear instead of my word. See, Amos, I have a message to give the people, and, and those prophets, they won't give it. And so Amos those prophets, they are afflicted with the same sickness that is among the people. A sickness of greed, a sickness of desiring more and never ever being satisfied. And so even those prophets out there are afflicted with that. They, they, they want, they want, and they're going to get it by teaching what the people, they think the people want to hear. And so Amos, you must tell them, you, a poor, poor wandering shepherd, you have to be the one because you have not been afflicted by that same kind of Greed and selfishness. You must go. Now, I have to confess, I never really thought about this before. It never occurred to me what prosperity, what contentedness even, could do to the spiritual life. I mean, to be sure, everybody experiences a kind of greediness from time to time. But when there is not much prosperity, when there is a lack of wealth, then Greed has no way to express itself. But when there is prosperity, when there is much that can be gotten, then everyone seems to be out to get it, and not just some of it or enough of it, but as much as possible, more than the other people we know. So I, Amos, was starting to see this. I was starting to see that, yes, this was an important message that God was giving me to deliver because things needed to change. But then God told me something else. The Lord told me something that it depressed me, it, it, it angered me all at once. He said, Amos, while I'm giving you this message to give to the people, let me tell you, it is already too late. It's already too late. You need to understand that these, I'm sending you to these rebellious people not to save them, but to tell them that I have to destroy them. In fact, their prosperity, their greed have already destroyed them, Amos. Which means that, Amos, they're not going to listen to you. I'm sending you to, with a message, but they will not listen to you. Don't expect them to. Now, I, I wonder what's going through your mind right now. Because I suspect that the age in which you are living now is a lot like the one I came from. You are witnessing in your own lifetime what prosperity can do to the spiritual life of a nation. You have begun to see the decay of your own society because of, of greed, haven't you? You are witnessing a famine in your land of the Word of God when many preachers are not preaching the Word of God but simply telling people what they want to hear. Does it frighten you to see it happening? Because it should. Is it already too late for you? Well, that I can't tell you, but it was for us. It was for us. It was already too late when God called me, Amos, to be a prophet. 
But this is why God came to me. This wild, beastly herdsman, because he needed someone who could, who could take it. Not only did God know that they weren't going to listen, but he knew that they were going to mistreat me, and they would abuse me. What did I care? I already lived a very harsh life anyway. I, I was used to fighting animals with my bare hands, so I knew to be able to handle whatever, these, whatever circumstances arose. But let me tell you what the Lord showed me. And what I in turn delivered to the people of Israel and, and, and see what you think the Lord would show me if it were sending the message to you. See, there I heard the Lord roar out of Zion. I say this in my book. In the first two chapters of my book, God, God gives one accusation after another against the nations of the area, and each one getting more and more strenuous. And then, then he says this, this is the name of chapter 2, for three transgressions of Israel and for four transgressions, I will not revoke my punishment. They have rejected the law of the Lord. They have not kept my statutes. They have led themselves astray by their own lies. They have even kept the prophets from speaking. For these four transgressions, I will not forgive them. How terrible is that? And the Lord continued to speak to me. I'm just paraphrasing now. But he said, these people, the, the, the people of Israel, my people, these are the only, only people I've ever blessed the way I've blessed anybody. They were my people. I brought them out of bondage. I, I made them my own. I led them for 40 years in the wilderness, after which I gave them a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and these of all people are mine, and I have protected them, and I've, I've never wanted anything but, but good, but the best for them. And because I wanted good for them, I wanted them to know their sin as well. I wanted them to know how their sin was putting up a barrier between us, and, but they wouldn't listen, and they only got worse and worse. Not only did they have to leave me, the true God, to go chasing after other gods, which are now gods at all, but they began, they began to abuse one another and exploit one another in order just to get more material wealth. And then God said this, this is in chapter 4 of my book, those fatted cows of Bashan, he says. Those fatted cows of Bashan, they were known for having the finest pastures, the cleanest waters to drink of in all the land. They were the fattest, sleekest livestock. Everything you want in livestock were those cows of Bashan. But then they would break down their fences to get over to someone else's pastures, even though the grasses were not nearly so green or the water so clear. And so God said, I'm just going to have to put a hook in their noses to draw them out, just like you would draw fish out of water. But they won't listen. Their greed is insatiable. And the Lord said to me, I've tried in every way to warn them, over and over again. There were times where I would withhold rain, and it didn't work. Time when the crops would fail, and there'd be locusts, and that wouldn't work. And so I brought them more powerful warnings. I, I, I had wars break out here or there, not enough to destroy them, but enough that... Many of their young men would die in battle and the, and, and the nation would be drained of its resources, but, but they wouldn't listen even then. Until Amos, until finally I did something that I'd hope I would never, ever have to do. Finally, I took away my word. For years and years, I sent no good prophets to them, no good preachers, and, and those who did preach wouldn't preach my word, only the things that they thought the people would want to hear. But it was nothing but fluff. I had hoped that when the people no longer heard my word that they would miss it, that they would hunger for it, but they didn't, and that breaks my heart. Maybe most of all, Amos, they did not even want to hear my word. So all these things are in my book, and all these things the Lord said to me as he was prepared to send me out. And so as I began my ministry among the people, I noticed all these things were true. Sure enough, they didn't want to hear from me. They didn't want to hear God's word. In fact, they were even complaining that I was asking them to stop work for a day or to, to, to do things in which they'd have to close up shop. I, they were upset when they couldn't use cheating balances, when they would 
exploit one another because their, their, their greed simply had no end. They would just, just wouldn't listen. There were people who were supposed to keep things in order. The judges, it was their job to ensure fairness, but instead they took bribes from the rich so that they could take advantage of the poor. The people would attack each other with lies. Traders in the market would use false weights. There, there was just no end, no end. But let me tell you something. None of those things infuriated the Lord as much as much as something else did. You know what it was? It was that these people, the same people who went chasing after other gods, who, who, who lied in the courts under oath, who cheated in their businesses, who, who didn't want to hear the word of the Lord, that these same people still came to the Lord's house to offer their sacrifices to the Lord with singing and with feasting. They still brought their offerings and worshiped in ways that Moses has taught us, but God hated it. At first, that doesn't seem to make any sense, does it? But you have to understand, they were still holding their feast days in God's honor as if, as if everything was all right. As if their sins didn't matter. As if this was all just for fun and just for show. But God despised it. All the, all the greed, all the idolatry, all the lying under oath, all of the disrespect for God's word. Sure, they were still singing their hymns and their anthems, but God he told me he loathed the sound of their music because they were, at the end of the day, it was hollow. It had no heart. They were just going through the motions. There was no spirit. Now, of course, any of us might do that from time to time. But the problem was, the problem was that they thought this really was all that God wanted. All that he wanted was a few minutes of their time, not really their hearts, not really their lives. So here is what the Lord told me to tell them. This is in chapter 5. He says, I don't want your sacrifices. When I was with you in the wilderness, you didn't sacrifice to me for 40 years, and I didn't mind that. What I minded was your murmurings against me and against Moses, and so I didn't miss your sacrifices, but I did miss, I did miss your trust in me. Even though you offer me your burnt sacrifices and, and grain offerings, I will not accept them. But instead, he says, let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. In other words, what God was telling me to tell them, what it all really comes down to is this. You have divided your life from your religion. Really, that's what it all came down to. This is the essence of God's verdict you have divided your life from your religion. They took God's mercy for granted. And that just wouldn't do. Their services of religion and their shows of piety weren't going to save them. Their, their, their long privilege as God's chosen people would not help them. By this point, God wouldn't even listen to their prayers. And so God showed me what he intended to do. And I have to be honest, I was terrified I was terrified at what the Lord said would come on this land. He showed me famine, pestilence, plagues of war and fires, and, and my, he showed my land totally devastated. Like I said, I was a shepherd, right? And I could remember one day, the Lord put this in my mind again. I remember a day when a lion came into my little flock and grabbed one of the little, one of the little lambs and ran off with it, and I chased it, and I caught that lion Killed it with my bare hands. And, but by that time, all that was left of that lamb was two hind feet and a piece of an ear. The Lord told me that by the time he was done with these people, that this was all that would be left of the nation of Israel. Just a couple of broken pieces of what was once a whole body. Believe me, I pleaded with the Lord to withhold his anger. But it was too late. At one point, God showed me a basket full of fruit. And he said, just like this fruit, the nation is ripe, rotten to the core. See, this was the burden I was entrusted with. The thing I was supposed to speak to the people, but I did. But let me say this to you. 
don't think that I was without also a message of hope. I told them, and you have to go to the very end of my book, but it is there. I told them that a small remnant would remain. They would come back from bondage, just a small 10%, but out of that 10%, just a mere stump of a nation. Yet from that, God would raise up a man, a branch of David's line, who would lead the people out of captivity, not political captivity, but spiritual captivity. And how I wish I would have seen him, if I could have lived to see that day, to see the Christ. Jesus of Nazareth, you call him. From this small remnant of a country, just holding on by the slimmest of threads, Jesus would come and restore the people to God once again, not just the people of the tiny nation of Israel, but people of every nation, of every continent, of every age. And let me just say one more thing, because I know very often, very often people will think that God, as he is described in the Old Testament, the God that, whose message we shared, we prophets, so that, that, that he's somehow too mean. He's too hateful. And then now, the, the now in your day and age, he, he, he's changed. That God's anger over sin is kind of gone. Well, believe me, that's not the case. God's anger over sin is very real. It's very scary. And neither is God simply in a better mood for you today than he was for us in my day. No, God is always the same. He's unchangeable. And so God's anger over sin, your sin, my sin, it is real. It is scary. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that is, is so important to understand that the, all the fire and brimstone, you know, all the horrific wrath and vengeance that God had me express has been taken out on his son. Can you understand that? What an what a awesome, humbling thing this is. Every time you or I commit a sin, God responds with anger, fierce anger, which he has every right to do, because he created us to be faithful to him, to serve him. But when we are unfaithful, when we allow other things to influence us more than God does? When we act selfishly and want to serve ourselves more than God? When we just want to compare ourselves to other people instead of comparing ourselves to what God expects? Then we're not fulfilling the role for which he created us. And so God has every right to be angry. God has every right to destroy each one of us for all of eternity, to, to vent his anger on us puny little creatures with, with endless agonizing death. But... Instead, he directs all of that on his son, his sinless, flawless son, Jesus, so that you and I, in turn, might experience all the blessings of God's grace and mercy, entirely undeserved, totally unearned. You know, of course, that the power of the Holy Spirit can change hearts. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can accomplish this total reform. The Spirit uses the Word of God to pound away at the stony exterior of our hearts, melt self-righteous attitudes, burn down the facade that has us think that we can be all right on our own. And then we have, when we have come to the realization of our sin, the Spirit uses the Word, the same Word that He used to tear us down, than to build us up, to, to build us up in the gospel message. The gospel assures us of all that Jesus has done for us. The law that we couldn't keep, Jesus kept it. The holiness that we couldn't attain, Jesus never lost it. The sacrifice we couldn't make, the Lamb of God made in our stead. New life and the resurrection to eternal life belong to you through faith in Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand now as we turn to God, confessing our sins and once again receiving forgiveness and good news. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. 
Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness before God, tainted by our own sin and corrupted by the evil of the world. Yet together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Jesus and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you and against each other in thought, word, and deed by our failure to do good as well as by the wrong we have done. We have sinned and cannot free ourselves. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, whose obedient life and life-giving death has redeemed us. Restore us by your Spirit. We may live holy and righteous lives, worthy of those who bear your name by baptism. Amen. Although we are unworthy, God is completely worthy. He hungered so that we could be completely satisfied by his mercy. He wept so that we can laugh with the joy of salvation. He was hated and reviled so that we can rejoice, for great is our reward in heaven. Because... As a called and ordained servant of Jesus Christ, and by his authority, I tell you that your sins are all forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. seated as we now worship the Lord with our offerings. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, for you made all things for your glory and still preserve them. When we abandoned you to pursue our own glory, we brought death and destruction upon ourselves. Yet you did not abandon us to our chosen fate. You inter intervened with hope through the prophets and the promise of redemption through your own Son. 
He was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and accomplished salvation for us by his suffering, death, and resurrection. Assembled in his name, we eagerly desire the gift of himself in this bread and wine, as his word promises. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In our famine, our Lord feeds. With this feast, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. distribution will be according to our usual method, ushering you up by the center aisles, returning by the side aisles. We also have alternative elements, gluten-free host and alcohol, low wine, for those who require it. Uh, and also be sure each week, if you would, review once again the communion uh, policy on the back of the attendance cards. The supper is ready.
Having received God's gifts and heard his word, we respond to him with thanksgiving and also go to him in prayers for various needs, all the things that are in our hearts and minds he invites us to share with him. And so some prayer requests to share with you today for Sue Schultz, uh, mother of Yvonne Rogers, who uh, uh, fell and broke her hip, now is in rehab. Uh, for Eleanor DeWald, Sean and Alex, I saw you back there, I think, right? So uh, how is Eleanor doing? Doing great, good. So glad that, uh, to hear that, to see you. Um, let's see, for Bailey Wilson, having hip surgery tomorrow for the family of uh, Dwayne's dad who passed away. Uh, for Michael Dory, recovering from surgery, uh, has pneumonia. So recovering from that complication. Prayers of Thanksgiving, including for uh, uh, Ben Gardner, recruited into the Marines. Is that a Thanksgiving thing? I don't know if that's a, I guess it's a good thing. Okay, good. Thank you, Ben, for your, thank you in advance for your service. Let's stand to pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we listen to your Old Testament prophets, help us to recognize that their word is just as true for us today and important for us to listen to now as it was back then. Certainly, Lord, we never want to separate our faith from our life, our religion from real living. And so, Lord, every day show us how Jesus Christ connects us to the world and to one another, all to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we come to you with prayers of need for ourselves and for others who are going through times of physical need or, or are the kinds of difficult challenges. We pray for Bailey Wilson, for Mike Dory, for the family of uh, Dwayne's father, for uh, Sue, and for Eleanor. Lord, for each of these, you know what their need is, and you know exactly, Lord, how they can be healed. We pray that they would experience that healing, and they have strength restored in their bodies, but also in their spirit. Lord, in your mercy, and Lord, there's always many things to be thankful for. We thank you for those who are experiencing special milestones in their lives this week, such as the baptismal birthdays of Gorland Bronstead and Katie Parsons, uh, Nathaniel Petros, Ken Franz, for the birthdays of Olivia Haddock, Macy Zinn, Jessica Dixon, for the anniversary of David and Judy Martin, also for Ben being recruited into the Marines, and Lord, for so many things in which you take us special places in life that we can live out our faith for the good of others and to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we do, of course, pray for ourselves, especially as we continue to go through a time of transition. We pray for the call process in which you have already chosen the next pastor who will serve here. Be with that person, even though he may not know yet who he is, and that call will be coming at some point, be it soon, late, but in any case, open his heart and his life to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For these and all the other things that are on our hearts and minds, we bring it together, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
please be seated. I'm going to take just a moment uh, of your time yet for a few announcements, things to know. Uh, by the way, I know it can be, I know that DeWald plan be con confusing. So it was Shauna and Alex, whose uh, baby came early, uh, not to be confused with Drew and Grace, whose baby is still coming in a couple of weeks or something. Good. So, uh, but they're all related. So, you know, they all, anyway. Uh, announcements. What have we got over here, Maya? You should get a microphone, eh? Okay, so today our stubs, they're already ready, they're out here, and um, they're in bags for the families, like, who ordered all together, and we have extras, like, extra sandwiches, extra vegetables, extra cookies, extra chips, extra everything, um, and the prices are over on the wall, and tomorrow we have our Valentine's dinner, and the kids will have to be here at 5 so we can get everything together. And the dinner starts at 7 here. Got okay. it. And that's it. Good. <laughs> Subway stuff today, Valentine's dinner tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Good. Anything else from you, Maya? All right. Uh, other announcements? Anything else to share? All right, then. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.